Welcome to the Uncomfortable Conversations podcast, the untold stories of the 3HO Kundalini Yoga community. I'm your host, Guru Nishan, and I was born and raised in this community, and the people of our community matter. So I started this podcast with several intentions in mind, and I read them at the beginning of every episode. Number one, to break the veil of silence that is long permeated and continues to strangle the 3HO Kundalini Yoga community in the name of neutrality. Number two, to validate and help clarify the complex feelings of those who have joined this lifestyle, were born and raised into it, and or who have practiced or taught Kundalini Yoga. Number three, to encourage active listening to uncomfortable conversations from our community as a revolutionary act of self and collective healing. Number four, to let survivors know that we see them, we believe them, we love them, and we will fight for their truth to be addressed. Number five, to let teachers who are denying gaslighting or spiritually bypassing know that what they are doing is willfully ignorant and re-traumatizing victims. Number six, to illuminate the inherent racism, homophobia, cultural misappropriation and exploitation that perpetuates the teachings, 3HO lifestyle, and overall community ethos. Number seven, to stop the perpetuation of gaslighting and victim shaming by naming it for what it is. Number eight, to dismantle internalized shame, guilt, toxic positivity, and light washing mentality. Number nine, to honor all of the parts of ourselves that have been forgotten or silenced. Number 10, to honor each and every body that has come through our community, both named and unnamed. And number 11, to encourage people to do their own research, process their own emotions, get somatic therapy, and other therapy and other support as needed, to draw your own conclusions and to be critical thinkers rather than to just blindly follow anyone. Please remember that your story matters. Please share it when you're ready. We're here to listen and to support you. I wanna welcome today's guest, Porter Singer, also known as Sirigun Kar. Porter Singer took her first Kundalini yoga class at the Golden Bridge in Hollywood, California in 2009. Drawn to the allure of this space and mainly the music they played, she signed up for, chi- for children's teacher training that same day. It was in that training she met fellow musician who invited her to be a part of the summer solstice sound team in June 2010. At Solstice, she learned about the month-long Aquarian teacher training at the Española Ashram in August, which she attended, which she ended up taking that same year too. Upon returning from this one-month intensive, she felt her identity slowly morph, adopting her spiritual name completely and wearing a head covering anytime she went out. Propelled by what she believed to be positive changes in her life, She decided to skip Christmas with the family that year in favor of attending winter solstice. There she reunited with two men from summer solstice sound team who would launch her further along her 3HO path. At summer solstice 2011, she married Hari Munder Singh and also released her first mantra album, The Music Within with Sat Darshan Singh. This album contained the single Bliss which would become the soundtrack for a Yogi Bhajan slideshow entitled Facets of the Master, 
played at every white tantric yoga event in the world. Things seem to be evolving magically. And in 2013, after the birth of her first son, she released her second album. Postpartum depression was really her first clue that Kundalini Yoga or Yogi Bhajan might not have or be the answer to everything. She, start, she started to seek alternative solutions to wellness. The more she researched and branched out, the more confining her life started to feel. And in 2019, she finally made the decision to separate from her husband and move from the Phoenix Ashram community. She now lives in Washington state with her two boys and her new partner. I wanna, I wanna welcome Porter Singer. Thank you for being here with us. Hi, thank you. Thanks for having me. So tell me why do you feel it's important to share your story? Really simply, I just feel that each story is a piece in this puzzle and I wanted to share mine to give another reflection into this universe that is, you know, 3HO and all of our unique experiences in it because they were all very unique. Common threads, but unique. Absolutely. A tapestry. Thank you. I'm excited to hear, um, we got to hear a, a, a wide lens of, of your experience. So I'm excited for you to dive into it. Being that I'm from the Phoenix community, so I got to meet you there. And um, yeah, so I'm just excited for you to be here. Let's. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> let's I'm not sure started. if I told you this, but <laughs> I I actually met you at Krishna Cars while I was doing yoga for youth teacher training, or afterwards. I re I remembered that, and so I, I remember meeting you from from there. But yeah, we we got to know each other in in the Phoenix. Ashram. And because uh, you did that in 2009. Yeah, yeah. It man, it it took it took me some doing to figure out what the, all the years were in the timeline and stuff. So yes, to the best of my recollection, <laughs> that's super. So you, uh, the children's teacher training you signed up for was yoga for youth. Uh, no, it was um, it was called Light Leaders at the Golden Bridge, and then right after that, I took the yoga for youth. Got it. Yeah, because yeah. I was living in LA and connected uh, in in two thousand nine ish. That makes sense. Yeah. How interesting! I didn't know that. I had no idea. I only I thought we had met in Phoenix. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, so you want to begin? Yeah. Do you want to bring us back? Like you gave us a timeline, but do you want to bring us back to the beginning? Like when you first started? Yeah. Um, so one of the things that I've noticed in my life is that the experiences that I get are sort of answers to questions that I've been asking myself. Right. So the way I got into 3HO was this, like this question of how do I find a place where I belong? You know, mm. where, where do I belong? Um, that was a big question for me for many, many years because I, I was born in LA, but my dad who was adopted had this sort of delusion that he was French. And so when my brother was born, he had what my mom describes as a midlife crisis and decided we had to move to France. It was like now or never, you know, like he had to do it now or it was never going to happen. So we, we moved to France and <laughs> but he didn't move to France. So he worked in LA and we were outposted in France as expats, knowing no one. Um, so my, then the other thing that I find interesting about my childhood that I was reflecting on recently is, is that I was like perfectly suited to becoming a cult member. I mean, I was used to isolation. I was used to being, you know, the weird one. I was used to feeling like I had information that other people didn't or that I was different. Um, my mom had a, you know, a philosophy of sort of, um, there were good people and there were bad people. And, you know, so all, all of, it, it's interesting. But anyway, I felt like I didn't really belong anywhere because I definitely didn't belong in France. I mean, I spoke perfect French, but when my, you know, people would hear my parents speak and be like, okay, who, you know, what, what's going on here? Obviously, like, how come you speak French? Your, your parents can, you know, your parents can't. And, and, and that was always awkward because my parents or my friend's parents were always correcting my parents, but um, as they do in France. And when I would go back to the United States, it was like, um, oh my God, you must love your life in, you know, in France, you know, because like I lived, I lived in a beautiful area, but 
I wasn't having the experience of what one would have when they go on vacation. I was having like a real life experience. And it was difficult being an American at that time in France at public French schools. I mean, I wasn't at like an American school. Um, so so I, I, I am used to being different. And I turned that like feeling of being different into a comfort in, be, in feeling superior. Mm. And that helped me get through it. It was like this defense mechanism, something that I, I heard a lot. Um, mm. or I heard when you were talking to some of the kids who went to MPA, that that was this defense mechanism that they developed. Um, and in a similar way, uh, I did very different circumstances, but mm -hmm. um, very interesting points, though, that you're talking about in terms of like, what prime what what your early life in reflection of what your early life how it primed to kind of like, to be excited about this, this special like the special knowledge, this special look the special mm -hmm. teaching the special. So like, how that was part of the hook maybe for you but also. Oh. Um, the, the, the looking for a place to belong for you talking about and for that a question that's going through you and I want to really just point out to listeners that this is a fundamental longing of being human which is why all of us are susceptible to cult because it's so primal in our need to long to belong yeah. and we want it to be somewhere where it's like oh my gosh we found it and it's like that's not how it works. It's <laughs> totally. And I mean, Western culture is completely unnatural, right? We all live in like our own little homes away from each other and we have our own little lives and we pretend like that's like enough, but we need community. So I love the 3HO community. I mean, the, the bright, shiny faces, the feeling of like embracing, yes, you're invited to chanting. Yes, you're invited to this. Yes, you're, you know, yes, come to my wedding. I mean, it was, it was like ridiculous that the things that open, 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 right? It just felt amazing. And current and just kind of like the, the allure as your kind of um, intro described, the allure of, of that, like we're all, everyone's welcome. Yes, yeah. So it was, you know, that was one of the reasons why I didn't do a ton of research or pay a lot of heed to people who were telling me like, really that group? <laughs> Um, but anyway, I'll, I'll work, I'll work up to that. So I, um, oh, and the other part of the specialness too, was that I was a musician. So I was always told that I was special because I had such a beautiful voice, you know, so I was special, special, special. And here I got to be, you know, so anyway, the, the specialness is like the, it's, it's like a drug. Mm -hmm. Um, but I, uh, I, I found, so somehow through like I did a, I did a yoga teacher training in Connecticut. And this was before I moved to LA, before you kind of started my bio. And in that I heard Sonatum's music. So somehow I ended up with a CD that had the Rehman Shabbat on it. And this was like total gibberish to me. I, I had no idea what it was. I just knew that it was beautiful. I, I like, I listened to it on repeat when I moved from Connecticut to LA in my car. I just like, I could not get enough of the sound. I mean, it was, mm. I wanted to live in it because I was a singer songwriter and my mode of expression was an expression of pain. And it was really hard for me to be this sensitive person that I was be writing these songs about all these breakups and then re-performing them, you know? So I was constantly like re-performing my, my thing. And I knew that there, you know, I knew that there were people who had kind of a different approach to music, but I hadn't I hadn't like tapped into it yet, right? I, I didn't really know how to express joy with music. Um, so that was another one of the questions that I was asking myself was like, how do I use music as to feel good? You know, like I, I wanna feel good when I play music. <laughs> um, so I'm, I get to LA, no idea what the Sreman Shabbat is. I mean, it, it could be for Mars, I have no idea. I knew it wasn't Sanskrit because it's like, I knew a little bit of that. So I walk into the Golden Bridge one day and honestly, I have no idea how I ended up there. And I'm, I, I walk in and that's the song that they're playing. And I don't know if you've, have you been to the one in, or were you at the one in Hollywood? I mean, it's a gorgeous space. Like how could you, you just, you want to be there or I wanted to be there. I Enchanting felt like. Enchanting all the wood and it was just. It was amazing. So, so I'm like, this is where this lives. This is where this is from, you know? And, um, 
I wanted more of it. I mean, it's like when you go to like an amusement park and you want to take home a piece of the, you know, so you buy all the souvenirs or, or whatever, like I wanted a piece of it. So I bought the teacher training. I, it was what was available. So, um, but then I ended up teaching a whole bunch of kids. People kept asking me to teach children's yoga. So for about a year, I was a children's yoga teacher, having really never taken a bunch of Kundalini yoga classes. Like I hardly knew what Kundalini yoga was. Um, but I just knew that I love that space and I love that song. And I mostly did songs with the kids anyway. So, um, but I did end up meeting Sat Jote. I don't know if you remember Sat Jote, who was the, he was a singer. They were playing a lot of his music at the, at the, um, Golden Bridge. And he was like, I'm going to summer solstice. Um, you want to come and be on the sound team? I can get you a spot. And I was like, okay. And I don't know what summer solstice is, you know, but I, I go. And, uh, and that was fun because I ended up playing music for, you know, a couple of classes and I did the sound team and whatever. And that's where I met um, Set Darshan. I don't think that was really clear in my bio, but the two guys that I met, Set Darshan Singh that I ended up doing, you know, my first album with and Huddy Mender, who ended up uh, becoming my husband and father to my two, to our two children. Um, so I felt, I felt a connection with Set Darshan. Like I knew we were going to, we were going to do something. I had no connection to Heidi Munder at all. And he, to me either. I mean, there was, there was nothing there. Um, but I ended up after I went to teacher training in August, I ended up, you know, going to winter solstice again. And it was there that he has this, like, as he describes as like the voice of God tells him that we're going to get married. Right. And he doesn't tell me this, but this is what happens at winter solstice. And so he looks up, he like stalks me on Facebook, gets my uh, birthday and sends it to his teacher in Phoenix, Guru Simrankar. Do you, did you ever meet Guru Simrankar? No. Yeah. Anyway, she was a student of Sangeet's and uh, she lived across the street from the Gurdwara. I'll get back to her because she plays a, an instrumental role in my, in my uh, joining. <laughs> Three Joe. Um where am I in my story? I'm at winter solstice. Anyway, yeah, so but I, you're describing that Heimann had this vision from God, but you didn't know this. This is just mm -mm. what he told you later. So you're just giving no. us awareness. Okay, no, in fact, I spent all winter solstice infatuated with some other guy. Um, <laughs> so I had no idea this was going on. Um, so yeah, I get back to LA and me and Sadarjan have decided that we're going to make a CD. So I'm going to move back to Connecticut. My parents are in Connecticut. I'm going to move into their guest house and we're gonna make a CD, um, which, was, which was super fun, but also sort of weird because my parents were like, who is this like turban guy, <laughs> you know, turban guy that you're bringing home? He's really sweet, but like, what is this? They're sort of observing like, what exactly is going on here? Um, and, uh, and so I come back, oh no, no. So this was, okay, I meet up with him over, this was, uh, sorry, my mind does not work chronologically. It works thematically. So, but okay. So Heidi Munder um, came to visit me in LA before I moved to Connecticut. Sorry, this is key. And at this point I told, you know, I told him there's more to the story and there's actually a whole blog on Spirit Voyage about it. But I told him like, I want to get married. That was, that was my that was my thing from teacher training. You know, it was like women, you should not be having sex before marriage. Um, you're selling yourself short. And I don't know. I was just at the point of my life where I was like, I'm ready to get married. I don't want to date anymore. So my new year's resolution that year was to get married. Huddy Mender tells me, um, he, we need to meet up in LA. So he comes to LA and we basically decide to start dating, I guess. Um, but again, yeah. Like, and no, he been courting you and stuff? He sent like, me a couple of messages, um, but he said, like, I really want to come out to LA and, like, get together and see how our auras blend. I, I remember that part of the thing. And I was like, okay, that's that's weird. Now, you had met him and Seth Darshan at the same time, and they were both new to the Dharma themselves? Seth Darshan was born in it, no. Born in the Dharma, but, and Hedmunder was not. Heidi Minder was, yeah, almost exactly the same timeline as me. So he had just done teacher training before summer sold that summer solstice. So Got it. okay. To get a framework. Okay. Yeah. 
Oh, and what happens next? Well, you so, guys decide on your own. You guys are going to get married. No, no. So okay. this is where Gudu Simran comes into it. Got it. Got it. Okay. So there's this, you, you know, thing him, that, but you explicitly tell him I'm looking to get married. And then he yes. tells you, he wanted to see how your auras blend and you guys are yeah. kind of like feeling into whether this yeah. is plausible. Right. Well, I basically, I didn't want to start a relationship where I didn't know that it was going to end in marriage. I wasn't saying let's get married now, but like, I don't want to date somebody indeterminately. Like I want to know that at the end of this, there is, you know, that we're both in. We're both was there somebody the you thing. were interested in that you were going for at this time or when you Not started at all. there? So you were just doing teacher training, getting into the yoga, getting into the music and then starting to morph into like, I'm ready to get married and kind of like have that scope. Yeah. Yeah. So you're like into the scene. So you, you must be like noticing what men are available or not. Right. And like you and Sadarshan connect, but that's not necessarily something that's feeling like relationship like. I don't think at this point I was thinking like it has to be a seek. I, I don't think I was, I okay. was so in at this point, okay. um, but I knew I wanted to get married. Okay. Um, so I end up going to uh, Phoenix for the last few hours of white tantric yoga, which is after he comes to LA. And this is right as I'm about to move to Connecticut. Uh, but he wants to, he wants me to come see him, see where he lives, meet, you know, meet the community there. I don't know, probably because he figures I'm going to end up there. Um, but I don't really know why I'm there. So he takes me to meet Guru Simran. Oh, and the other thing is when I get to Tantric afterwards, like everybody knows who I am. <laughs> like, oh yeah, we heard, we've heard about you because Honey Mother's been talking to me about, um, to everyone, right? And, and, and it was a little odd because I didn't realize that we were, we were even really dating. <laughs> I mean, you know, we had kissed, but it like, it wasn't, it wasn't serious. It wasn't that serious to me. So he, he takes me to Guru Simran and she does our numerology and this is, this is her thing. And she spends like an hour and a half, I think with us. I mean, a good, a good chunk of time telling me what sadness I need to do. I need to smile more. I need to stop wearing earrings. I need to, um, you know, do this meditation and that meditation and this, I mean, like most of the hour and a half was about improvements to me right <laughs> and you know and then a little bit of like oh how do you is such a gift <laughs> and um and so by the end of it I was actually really pissed off I was like like why is she talking about us like we're married and we need you know and and we need to know how this is going to work out like I don't like I haven't agreed to this yet um and I ended up leaving kind of like driving off, you know, through the desert, like you do from Phoenix to LA, just sort of fuming, like, what, what was that, you know, but he calls me in the middle of it and kind of talks me down. And, and I was like, it doesn't sound like you want me. It sounds like you want someone to be, you know, this like spiritual human for you. <laughs> you know, it doesn't sound like you're, you're looking for what I have to offer. Right. Um, but I wasn't really strong enough to, I mean, if, if I said that now, then that probably would have been a deal breaker. But at the, the woman that I was at that time, you know, looking to belong to something, looking for love, I'd had a lot of like, again, not great relationships that I'd been writing songs about. And, and the, you know, the idea of having something wonderful that somebody told me was numerologically solvent, you know, like this is the perfect match numerologically. I, I guess I didn't say that, but you know, that was the reason that he invited me there in the first place, because when he gave her our numbers, she was like, Eureka, wow. this is, this is the match, right? So we always considered our marriage arranged because again, we had no physical attraction towards each other. Um, we were just willing to make it work because that's what you, that's what we felt like you do in the Dharma is you, you know, get married and make it work. So pause. Go ahead. We just need to feel that one for a second. <laughs> because we're talking about 2000 and what here? Uh, 2010. Uh, yes. At this 10. point. And I want to feel the weight of what you just said. You said, you know, that's just what we do. We considered our marriage arranged because 
like it was by destiny you know it was told that by destiny this is the way it should be so to speak however that came about and and you would make it work and that is the persona of how a relationship is as you make it work and that to be like the compounding interest of a thought or uh, an action, a repeated seed for that was planted decades earlier from all the arranged marriages and all of that. And you're just speaking that out like that was the atmosphere. That's interesting. As a, right? as a student, you entered into, and that's the that's what you received from the atmosphere. Right. Well, and then there's all the encouragement too, you know, like, like, yes, that sounds like a wonderful idea. You know, this is <laughs> normal. Yeah. It's it amazing, is normal. Right. It's a part of it. That's actually, it's actually celebrated. Mm -hmm. Yeah. My parents did not feel that way about it, <laughs> but, but, you know, eventually they, they, they got over it because they love me, but um, bless them. Um, so anyway, I'm, I'm realizing I'm not looking at my notes at all, but I think I, I got this from memory. Um, I, I end up going to Connecticut. I end up finishing the album with Satarshan. We crowdsource it again. Like that's amazing to me. Like we, I was what, you know, several months into this community and we were able to raise money from community to make our album. That was just, wow. it was amazing to me. So he and Heidi Mender ends up invite um asking me to marry him over Skype because again numerologically <laughs> it was a good day apparently to be um to be communicating with me so he asked me to marry him and I'm like yes yes I I, I did not have any I didn't have any reservations about that that seemed of course like this makes sense numerologically <laughs> you know um, this makes sense. And I wanted to get married and look, it's all falling into place. So I want to pause again and just speak to what you had said about the astounding community, like the people, like crowdsourcing, crowdsourcing, I'm guessing is that you're saying it raised money from people donating money to help you get your album. And then mm -hmm. that is how the album circulated and got sold. Yeah. It's so beautiful because again, it speaks to the heart that the people of our community is who built all of our companies and support the artists and you know it's like we the people you know not the institutions that siphoned the energy of the people absolutely and i i especially didn't take this for granted because i had been doing the singer songwriter thing trying to you know get people to listen to what i was doing for a couple of years and so the idea that there was like a built-in audience there was a built-in demand for what we were producing was amazing it was it was beautiful so and people would know about you because you've already played at solstice uh both winter and summer solstice right so like your well, your your voice is your your known so to speak i don't think they knew who i was even necessarily i think they knew set darshan because he had grown up in the community some people probably knew who I was, um, maybe even some of the people, you know, from my past music playing too, maybe family members and things like that. But I think most of the people were, were people that said Darshan knew and were getting to know me. Got so, um, in, so Gudu Simran again decides that summer solstice 2011. So mind you, the first time we kiss is February, it's President's Day of 2011. March 25th, he asks me to marry him. June 19th, I'll say me here. <laughs> wow. June 19th, we are getting married. And in my mind, this isn't like crazy. This isn't like fast crazy. This is like fast, like, wow, Kundalini yoga works. It gets you what you need fast, right? Interesting. Yeah. So we, we get married at summer solstice. Um, and then we decide mutually that we're going to take Amrit together that same, that same year, not a hugely difficult decision for me. I had been vegan, um, raw vegan actually before Kundalini yoga, uh, for like, you know, three years at this point. Um, 
so that part wasn't a big deal, you know, no shaving, no problem, you know, premarital sex, check, check, because we're married. <laughs> um, you know, I just don't have to cheat on him and uh, no alcohol, but you know, that was fine too, because I hadn't been drinking. So it didn't seem like a big deal to me. And it seemed like if he was going to do it, that I might as well too, because we're like in this together. Um, but I remember him having a very like sort of mystical experience of this and me going sort of like, okay, so we just like stood and we just drank sugar water. Like I, I, I didn't, it wasn't, it wasn't a deeply felt experience for me. Now the marriage, that was, that was beautiful. That was amazing. And Sonatum actually played at that. And so again, it was like, I came into this through Sonatum. Now I've asked Sonatum to play at our wedding. Here we are. I mean, it was, it was, uh, yeah, it was really lovely. And, and the, you know, just the community and everything. But I remember um, from this ceremony, so there's the, the rounds, right? And the first round, I believe, forgive me if I'm getting this wrong, but the first round I believe is the community. So you're marrying the community. Mm. The second round is you're marrying each other. I'm gonna get this wrong, but anyway. The, the part of it that stood out to Harimander was the marrying the community. The part of it that stood out to me was our relationship to each other and our relationship to God. That was kind of what stood out to me. The community was a given, but I remember having this conversation with him on the way back because he immediately in our marriage immediately sort of went into save a mode. He start, you know, he was on the board for uh, yoga phoenix it 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 morphed but it was like more and more community involvement and not much relationship you know we didn't go on dates we didn't we weren't in what i would consider like a normal relationship um but we weren't but we were friends you know so it wasn't like uncomfortable but also we, we were very different. I mean, we were fundamentally very different. We had very different upbringings. Um, and we were also older. So we were used to being both very independent. So that was, that was something that was difficult to contend with. But anyway, I got into um, this kind of Sangeet circle in Phoenix when we moved back. And the message that she was giving were sort of like the women's teachings from her perspective. So what I know of the women's teachings are mostly from her books and from going to lectures and things. And what I got from it were things like, you know, don't show your husband that you're upset. He can't handle it. If you need to cry, go cry in a closet. Um, you know, that just things that were especially difficult for me now, like understanding myself more, I am really sensitive. And I don't necessarily expect people to pick up my pieces, but I can't hide that. <laughs> so having to do that was really difficult. It was, it was really, um, it felt really wrong, but, but mm. I wasn't, ver I couldn't verbalize that at that, at the time. It just, it was sort of like this, you know, like, like you talked to so many people on this podcast about, right. I internalized it. It was like, there must be something wrong with me that I can't adjust to this. I can't adjust to, you know, being this perfect spiritual wife for him. Like I can't just swallow it and bring cookies and tea because that mm. was the, that was also one of the other can, messages. Yeah. Can you give us some more ideas of the messages that you got through this lens? This Man, it's, it's kind of, it's kind of a blur because it was, <laughs> let's see, Pr you know, pray, like just the woman, the woman's role I mean, this, it, it's, it's hilarious. It, it's hilarious when I think about it now. It's like the, the, woman's, the woman's role is to be this superhuman because quote, she is well, uh, more evolved, <laughs> you know, <laughs> she, is, she is stronger. She is, you know, better. Basically like we are better human beings and therefore we are responsible <laughs> for men, you know? Um, which oh is, God. it's, it's just, sort of it's like, so when I woke up to this, I got a pause, Lord Singer, I, oh my gosh, Lord. When I woke up to this. I was like, oh my gosh, I would even say out loud. I'd be like, 
I can't agree with these women's teachings because it's like so subversively conniving. It says women are 10 times stronger and 10 times more connected to God. And therefore men need women and therefore women need to serve the men. <laughs> and I was like, what? It's so secretly manipulative and disguised in a different form. And yet it's also in plain sight. One of my favorite examples of how this played out in my marriage was when we had kids and, and Hedy Munder would say, um, I'm right into our oldest son would like mac and cheese. You make it so much better. Could you do it? <laughs> but anyway, so, you know, and I mean, I just want to pause and just say, you know, essentially we're talking about like codependent and enmeshment patterns. You know, you don't have to be in 3HO or in a cult to have yeah. codependence and enmeshment patterns in a relationship. And we all usually come from them. So we can't identify them any, any differently, but to have them in a body of teachings disguised as grace and disguised as like the right way and the wrong way to be a woman. And it's so important what you're saying here. And that's why I asked you to speak to it because um, I don't particularly know her as a teacher, as a kid, I grew up in the ashram, she was there. And so I know she morphed into quite a, you know, a large following and with a real lens of her numerology and all of that and with an emphasis on the women's teaching. So it was fascinating to hear yeah. what points you pointed out as a new woman in the role of the married, the, you know, the role of the wife in the Dharma. Yeah. I will say too, one of the things that I thought was, and I love this word toxic positivity. One of the things that I thought was evolved, but in reality is just sort of pushing everything under the rug is nobody wanted to talk to me about talk to me about my marriage. I mean, nobody wanted to hear what was going on. They wanted to give me a meditation to get over it. They wanted to, you know, tell me I needed to do more sadhana. And that was the same thing when I was, you know, when I was depressed after my daughter was born and I was so upset about his birth. Like nobody wanted to talk to me about that. And I felt, and it wasn't so much like they said, okay, shut up. You know, we don't want to hear it. it like, I felt ashamed to share it because I'm supposed to be better than this you know anyway mm. it's so important what you're saying yeah that it resound because it's so important so we we again went to winter solstice in the in december i mentioned these because we we did this for a while you know we our only vacations were summer and, and winter solstice and uh and at winter solstice i remember just feeling sort of like the strangeness of being married, but also being alone because he didn't want to room together. He wanted to, he wanted us to stay in like separate. So he wanted to make me to be in the women's cabin and him. And I can't remember exactly why we did that. Maybe because we didn't want a tent. Maybe there, I don't know. He didn't want to do couples cabin. I don't remember exactly, but I just remember feeling like we're just doing our own thing. You know, I like, I don't have a partner. I have like a I don't know. I have a piece of paper. Um, interesting. Did you have any context for it or anywhere to share that within the community to talk about that? Is that what you mean? You couldn't, you couldn't I think for that? a while, I sort of felt like that was normal because we weren't a love match. You know, we like, I sort of felt like maybe that's just what spiritual marriage looks like. Hmm. Um, but then I started to notice my friends get married and how in love they seemed with their, with their husband, even within 3HO. And I'd be like, you know, how come I don't want to hold hands with my, you know, with my husband? How come, you know, we don't, I don't know. I would notice little things. It was like, it's like an accumulation, you know, it's like, like the drop in the bucket that finally, you know, fills up. But mm -hmm. um, I wasn't acutely aware of how strange that was. And like I said, my, my dad, or maybe I didn't, th my, my dad was barely present in my life growing up, even though my parents were married for my entire childhood. So the idea of an absent partner wasn't totally bizarre to me. <laughs> so, right. Yeah, absolutely. There was a part of norm normality for your, your system around that. Yeah. So anyway, um, and, and I, I want to say like, he, I really don't fault him for this. I mean, I feel like we were both in this strange situation. You know, we 
he wasn't any more in, you know, in love with me than <laughs> I was in him. We were trying to make it work as best as we could. Um, but okay, so in 2012, I discovered that I'm pregnant, which is a little sooner than I wanted it to happen. But, um, but I'm like ecstatic. I mean, when I find out there's like not, not a second of regret there. And um, uh, I went to, that was another year. I went to solstice. I go to solstice. I'm so, so sick <laughs> at solstice. I, I was supposed to lead sadhana actually, but I took a prenatal pill that morning on an empty stomach, which is a, not a good idea. And, and I ended up uh, in the, the first aid for the whole time. So I did not lead sadhana. Um, but anyway, 2012 basically was, I was pregnant. Um, in, in 2013 was when I gave birth to, uh, to a murdenter, which was a really, really traumatic experience for me, um, having nothing to do with 3HO. A little bit, I suppose, because I think the idea of home birth is, you know, is a, a normalized thing in, in, in 3HO. And, and, and I totally believe in, in home birth. I'm definitely not advocating for not home birth, but I didn't know enough to know what was going on. And I ended up getting myself in a situation where I was quote unquote late. I was like, at 42, possibly like 43 going on. I mean, he was, he, he was a gestator. I'm right under. He wanted to stay in there and not come out. And my midwife got freaked out because what happens is that they lose their, they lose like their right to, to be at the birth. And if something goes wrong in this sort of gray zone of midwifery, they could go to jail. You know, a doctor, if something goes wrong, you know, gets a little, it's a little wrist slap and you know their their insurance covers it or whatever but a midwife is in huge trouble but she didn't share this with me so she's very nervous and i don't know why mm -hmm. and anyway for the short story is is that the ambulance shows up in the middle of my of my uh my birth this like you know i wanted it to be this like beautiful you know spiritual like water experience and it was not and um and I re actually related it to this sexual trauma that I had as a high school student. Huh. When, when you were talking with Olivia and she was talking about the freeze mechanism that happens. So when I was in high school and my boyfriend took, well, you, you know, I don't even know what to describe it, like touched me in a way that I was you know, not ready for, I froze. And I confused that for, and he confused that for consent. You know, I, in my mind, I was like, well, I didn't say no, <laughs> you know, so like, but I, but I didn't want it. And when the ambulance showed up, I didn't, I didn't want it, but I felt like I had failed. Mm -hmm. And, and I, so I just gave up and I didn't need it either. He was crowning when this ambulance came in. So anyway, I was in this situation where I felt like a total failure. Um, I felt extremely traumatized from having these like huge men come in my, um, my house and try to tell me jokes in the ambulance and, and whatever. Um, and then, you know, and then the doctor, like, like giving me an episiotomy and then, you know, like ripping the baby and giving me to, and I end up with this baby and I'm, it, it's the most conflicting feeling I could describe because I am in love with this child. Like there's nothing I want more, but I am horrified because I, it's not how it's supposed to feel. I like, I know this internally, right? Like hormonally, it's just, it's not flowing, you know, it's like not what I feel for him, but how it was supposed to feel for everyone. Like something got ruptured and I felt really, um, really upset about that. And I think Huddymunder did too. I think that it was like, I think we were all not, not okay by this experience, but as it often happens and it's, this is not the fault of, of 3HO. It, um, it, the focus ends up being like, Oh, everyone's alive. Wonderful. You know, right. everyone's alive. So anyway, we, we did the 40 the days grieving, skipping the process of what yeah. needs to be grieved. Yeah. So I'm, I'm like crying every night and, you know, like I'm trying to, how do you know doesn't really get it? Cause he's like, you know, it's okay. You, you did it, you know, like, like, I, but 
I couldn't, I couldn't shake it. And it, it, I was never diagnosed with postpartum depression, but because I felt depressed and it was after the birth, I sort of diagnosed myself two mm -hmm. years later because I didn't know what was going on. Um, but I was, I was in a funk for a while and no amount of meditation and sadhana. I was doing bound Lotus through my whole, I did a thousand days of, I didn't mention that I started bound Lotus a thousand days in 2010 at my first summer solstice. And I had been doing this throughout my marriage and my pregnancy. I did it the day of, you know, of like, I'm, I'm, uh, you know, con having contractions and, and <laughs> doing my bound Lotus sadhana. Um, and, and did it the day, you know, like I didn't, I did not skip a day. Um, but it, I want to just point out here that you're talking about is you're, you're extreme into Kundalini yoga. You're doing meditation. You're doing daily practice. You're on 40 day, thousand day meditations, regular sadhas, this type of stuff. I'm superstitious at this point. I mean, I believe like if I stop, like something, I, I would have never said this, but basically like something bad is going to happen. You know, mm. um, I'm going to, I don't know. I'm going to lose my, my mastery crown or something. I don't know. I, I don't know what I thought was going to happen, but I, it wasn't, it wasn't an option. I wasn't going to stop. Um, but I'm, I'm just, I'm just in a funk, you know? Um, and this was when I made the cosmic gift. So I'm like in the middle of making an album too. Um, which was, which was hard adjusting. So it, that part was hard, but adjusting to being a parent was really difficult. Huddymunder had extreme difficulty adjusting to being a father. Um, and one of, one of the difficulties in our marriage was that I couldn't leave him alone with Umrud Hunter. So I had to constantly be with, with Umrud Hunter. Um, and Umrud Hunter was very, very attached. Like he, he, he would not stop crying if I left him with somebody, you know, for like an hour, like, or something like that. So it, you know, and, and having two now, I realized like, I probably was a little bit more, you know, mama, um, mama bear, um, than I needed to be, but you know, every child is different. And for whatever reason, he just, he was traumatized by that birth too, you know? So it, it was a hard adjustment for everybody. Um, but where was I? It was going something. Well, somewhere just for clarification, um, and only because I know you, I can ask this. Um, Huddy Munder was also like, um, you had said he'd gotten into Seva, but he's running the yoga center by this point or he, on the board? Or I don't know. That, really no, he's not running the, the yoga center yet. Okay. <sighs> but you both are just quite involved in, in, at least he's quite involved in the he's, community. Yeah, running. he's going to like the Gurdwara meetings. Um, he has this coconut business that he does every other Friday. He's making like coconut cream as on top of his actual job. Um, yeah, he didn't know how to help me. He didn't, he didn't know how to help me. <laughs> and you're still actively making music. Yeah. Yeah. So I, I, I made this, I mean, and I didn't know what it was going to be like. Together, right? Right? Was it he helping with the music production and stuff? No, no, that wasn't. No, okay. I, I had Ram Das come um, down to do that. But yeah, so then that, that album was also crowdsourced, which was really sweet. Um, but anyway, so that was released at that next summer solstice. And that was, I mean, that was really when things, when summer solstice became not fun. Like that was, I think that was like a tipping point. Cause up until then, it had been two summer solstices, two winter solstices. And it was like, it was a chill affair, you know, it was nice. You got to see community. You, you know, you, the sadness, it was beautiful. The, you know, the sound, um, it's just, it was gorgeous. It was beautiful experiences, but going with a baby, um, I was not sleeping. I was, I was having a really difficulty adjusting to, um, the wake ups and getting back to sleep and napping. You know, they say like, you, you should sleep with your baby. I mean, I really was trying, but it's, I wasn't used to broken sleep. I was used to getting, you know, a good night's sleep. And, and so I was like kind of mentally deranged. I mean, I, I, I was sleep deprived, you know? Um, and when I'm sleep deprived, I'm not a fun person. I know some people it's like food. Like I can go, I can go a long time without food, but if you get me no sleep, I am, I'm not someone you want to be around. And I went to summer solstice, 
um, already kind of on this like odd sleep schedule. And then I, I don't think I'd offered to lead sauna that year. I hope I didn't, I may have, but I, there was nowhere that was quiet to take a nap, you know, and the tent's really hot. I mean, I ended up just taking a nap in the tent actually, and just sweating because that was like the best I could do. But it was that year that they, they took away the trailers, which had like little rooms and they, they made it like one big tent, which was, it was really sweet. It just, there was no sound, you know, there was no sound barrier, which is important for me. So I remember going to registration and they're like, I need a place to sleep, you know, I'm like, and, and like, what was so demoralizing was like, if you complained even like a little bit or like asked for help, it was like, well, my mom used to bring, you know, all three of us and, you know, she'd sleep two hours and there wasn't even lunch then. And, you know, so it, it was, it, it's like, you talk to anybody in the outside world about how hard it is to bring a newborn camping, you know, and they'll be like, yeah, I wouldn't sign up for that. Mm -hmm. But in, but in our community, it was like, what's wrong with you that you can't figure this out? You know, so Whoa. that was frustrating to say the least. And very real, you know, very real to where it's just not even safe to share that you can't do it. You know, you need help, you know, yeah. like there was no space for that. Right. Well, that was the other thing, because a lot of the people who, who brought their, you know, their newborns and their kids would either be like Espanola residents and they would go home, you know, for the day, or they would have family members that would relieve them. Or, I mean, we, we had no one, we were, we were, you know, on our own. And even though people were very sweet, nobody was like, can I relieve you for a few hours? You know, because I suppose I could have asked, but I, I didn't. Um, and, and that was when I started also getting like really, really horrible unsolicited parenting advice or rather like parenting scolding, <laughs> you know, um, from, from, you know, various uh, 3HO prized mothers. Um, and, and that's hard, you know, that's hard too. Like it, yeah. Oh, Not do disclose, let us hear some of that. You know, well, you've probably heard some of it. It's like, um, I can't even think, I know, think it's of, hard on the spot. What, what some of this <laughs> stuff was, honestly. Mm -hmm. I mean, I know one of it was like, you know, you have to give your child that was it like 10 minutes to themselves every day where you put them on the white blanket or, or whatever? To be really honest, I'd like to hear them because I think that it's still a part of my unconscious construct, <laughs> you know? And so it'd be I nice mean, a lot of them were out loud. Cool. A lot of them were, oh, I know. One of them was like, you should only feed your baby every four hours or three hours or something like that, which is not advised by, by experts. Like the general consensus is two hours. And honestly, for a newborn, I mean, my friend who's a lactation consultant, she, there's like, it's no problem just having them on you all the time. Like that's not, there's, mm. there's not, no bad as, I mean, hits a little hard on the mom, but print, but Umber Dunter was like that. He was like, he was like on me constantly. So I would get this, you know, feedback of like, you should really train him to, you know, only eat for this amount of time. Like I remember one of the moms, she would do every, I think this was what it was every three hours and the baby would get 10 minutes aside. And I was like, I, I don't, that's, it seems so abusive. Horrible. I mean, I don't know, but I'm glad you're saying it because I remember a post of a second gen who had talked about her choices to, to make different choices than what she had been told should be the right choices as a mother in, in 3HO. And, and the, the amount of shaming in it that she got yeah. for that. So I'm glad you're bringing this up because I don't know what these different rules are, so to speak, but I've always had this unconscious assumption that this is right because this is just how this indoctrination has worked within me. And without even having the critical skills to be able to ask and because I haven't been a mother and birth myself, I haven't investigated that per se. And I'm saying, I know there's more. And if, if you think of them, I think it's really important to, to disclose. I'm sorry, I'm just noticing the time. Have I been talking for, for that? I'm so, wow, I'm not even like halfway through. Shoot, I have to speed up. Um, 
Yeah, no, they would know more than I do because they probably got a lot more advice than I did, my, my gosh. But yeah, just even in that framework, I want to say that it, it can sound like helpful advice, but it sounds like it, it, comes, it can come across as being shamed for not doing the right thing. And then you start going back and questioning yourself. And, and yeah, that was the state that was happening. Yeah. Yeah, it also just seemed unfair. You know, one of them was like, we were in a circle and is it Gururaj? No, not Gururaj. Any, one of the, the women, the elders, she, she was like giving sort of a seminar on, on babies and she was giving me some sort of advice. And I can't remember what it was, but I knew from being this child's mom that like, we just hadn't slept very well, you know, but she was like have, coming up with some sort of psychological diagnosis. And, and I, I had to leave. I was like, this is, this is ridiculous. Like, we're just fucking tired. <laughs> like, that's it, <laughs> you know? Um, and it's, and it's hard up there too. I mean, just energetically for, for all the children, they have different, um, coping mechanisms. Some of them sleep the whole time. Some of them don't sleep at all, but anyway, so we, uh, at this, this was the year when Spirit Boys asked me to make an album with Thomas Berkey again, like, oh, I mean, amazing. Cause that's, that was who made that Prima and Shabbat that I had been listening to. I'm going to really speed up here, but, um, oh, go ahead. I just was like, wow, full circle kind of moment here. Yeah. Well, there were so many moments like that, that it was like, they were affirming. They, you know, like that, that something was going, something was going right. And then, you know, other things. So it's, it's, you know, it's like the polarities of, of uh, wonderful and, you know, absurd existed, <laughs> existed simultaneously. It's what makes it so complex because unraveling it there's so much love and appreciation wrapped in manipulation and coercion and and silence and predatory weirdness and so it's so weird to like how do you how do you how do we draw it apart because there is such richness and goodness too it, yeah yeah we're all contending with that right now and and answering that question in all of our different ways you know so so yeah I, I basically ended up making uh, the two albums with, with Spirit Voyage. One was sort of like a spinoff album like they do. We made a meditation thing. But that was exciting because it was kind of the first time I had accrued a large audience for, for the music that I was doing and started making kind of, uh, kind of an income, you know, from, from doing it, which was, I mean, you can't ask for more as a musician. And, and Hedy Mender is getting like more and more involved in, um, in the community in Phoenix. We actually moved down to the ashram area because we used to live kind of in suburbia. We moved down to the ashram area. And, and it was, I, when I was reflecting on this, it's very easy to be convinced that your marriage is okay when there's a lot of distraction like that too, you know, because there's not a lot of alone time. There's not a lot of, of time to kind of check in and, and see how things are going. So I think that's why it was able to last, you know, it was like an eight year marriage with very little romance or, you know, um, you know, there was, there was physical intimacy. We weren't like celibate, but it, it was not, it wasn't a, it wasn't like a, a what was the word? It wasn't like a cherishing thing, mm -hmm. you know? So, so Yeah. Um, I get pregnant again, and this is like my redeeming moment. I, I get to do this, but it, that was like the time because I had to do all this because I had, I felt like I really needed to research this better. I really needed to figure this out so that I could have like a positive experience this time. I was listening to all these like really um, free people speak about their lives, you know, cause they're, they're talking about their, their births and I ended up free birthing from the aunt, um, which means I, I didn't have a midwife. It was just, it was just me and, and Hedy Mender. I mean, free birth, you could have other people there too, but there, there was no sort of like professional there. Um, and, and I, I decided for myself that this was the safest way for, for me to birth because I couldn't, I couldn't uh, guarantee a situation where I was even going to be acceptable to a midwife. Like I knew if, it's like, if I just ate for 43 weeks again, I'm, you know, or I'm, I'm done. I like this. I'm going to end up at a hospital and I didn't want to. What you're talking anyway. about with birthing laws with midwives, is that per state? Is that different in different states? I know you've they, done a lot of studies. They on vary, birth. but that's pretty standard. 
okay. um, that the fact that like, I mean, some of them might be like the midwife just has to hand you over. Um, in Arizona, it's that it's just sort of this gray, this gray area. But yeah, you'd have to check with your own state. I, I can't speak to that. Yeah, so um, I'm learning about I'm learning about unschooling and and all these like varying um, you know wonderful ways to raise your kids, which really don't go hand in hand with how 3HO you know does things because um, from what I was observing with you know kids raising their their children in 3HO was you know they, they would take them to Gurdwara they'd wear their Putkas or their head coverings or whatever. And, and they would be kind of indoctrinated into this. I wasn't calling it that at the time, but they would be like indoctrinated into, you know, the, the lifestyle of 3HO as the right way to live. And I, I didn't do, I never did this with, with my kids, even when, when I was in it and I believed in it. Um, I, that was never my goal. I, I never wanted my children to become Sikh, you know, necessarily. I mean, I wasn't against it, but, um, but I wasn't trying to raise Sikhs. I was just trying to raise humans. And, uh, and so it's funny because like now that we've, we've left and stuff, I, I realized my children even, didn't even know the word Sikh. <laughs> oh. <laughs> they knew the word Gurdwara because we would go there. But yeah, it was, it was cute. Now at this um, point, you're still practicing Kudalini yoga? I'm mostly doing music, honestly. I haven't done a lot of classes i'm mostly mothering actually that's that's the truth i'm mostly mothering i i would i felt guilty not doing the sadness so it was this kind of this always like tug of war um which was another thing that actually made postpartum um in both cases a little bit difficult but with permbiana it was it was so much it was amazing um he didn't cry for like until he started teething he slept through the whole night. I mean, it was, it was such a different experience. After your free birth with him. Yeah, because it was so gentle. I mean, it was, it was just, it was like, it was like exhaling. Yeah. Um, but, but that, yeah, that sort of like, I really should be waking up at 3 a.m. I mean, that would go through my head every single night. Like, am I going to wake up to read Jepchi and do sadhana? And I really don't feel like that's a pressure that, new moms should have on top of all of the all of the other ones and granted it's like a pressure that we put on ourselves I mean I put that on myself it wasn't like somebody was making sure that I did this but I registered this and it became this metric that I had to live up to well, and I want to pause there and say, we do internalize these voices, but they're in voices that are permeating the atmospheres in which we're allowing ourselves to be molded or as children, we get molded by. Yeah. So yes, we internalize them, but they don't belong to us initially. They came from the collective environment or the ethos. Right. I think that the, I, the, the fact that I wanted to uphold them so much is a personality trait, but I think that you're right that it definitely, I mean, it definitely was a message that I got from the outside. Well, I didn't it's good teacher training. Product. We know that that's very much a part of like kind of what, what it means to be the teacher, right? If you're going to live uh, up to the woman of right. 3HO, if you're going to live to any of any aspect of the teachings, right? There's prescriptions to these things. And so we end up creating this internal voice that say, am I living up to this prescribed ideal of the way we should be. And I think what's illuminating a lot in these conversations and just in all of the tapestry of what's been shared is the never ending feat of trying to chase perfection when really it's like the vulnerability of feeling what we are. Yeah. And, but it's, it was a constant chase. It almost became a joke. Like if you did everything that he ever said you have to do every day, you'd run out of the amount of time to do it. You know what I mean? So if we, we were paying attention to that, there's, it's impossible. And yet it doesn't change what you just said, that we have this inner internalized shaming that becomes, I'm not living up to X, yeah. whether it's the mother, the woman, the wife, the yogi. Yeah. It's interesting. I, I really craved meat when I was pregnant with Umredenture. Mm. And I would tell people that who were not in 3HO and they would look at me like, just eat some meat. And, but, but I'm like, I can't, I can't do that. Like, you know, <laughs> I 
of course everyone three ho was like go get a you know go get a fake meat patty go get it you know and i was like that's that's not what i want um but i i didn't i couldn't i couldn't do that but that's insane that's that is insane <laughs> looking yeah. back on that now so so yeah um I actually, I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to skip ahead, which is fine, because um, you didn't ask me to stick to a timeline. I did. <laughs> um, but, but so I, I get basically my transition out of 3HO is joining another cult. And well, when I, and you but, jump there, hold on, before yeah. you get there, I do want you to just jump to wherever you want. But I do want to ask, can you distinctly name a, a, how you went from being doing bound lotus every day meditating regularly to this kind of slow morph of realizing my attention needs to be on being a mother and a musician. And was it about that you were becoming more prominent as a musician? So more of your attention went there and there was less attention elsewhere? Or was there something actually that you stopped for other reasons, just in your own awareness? Well, I started kind of taking what I wanted from it and I actually ended up teaching these classes because I'm really interested in emotions. Mm. And I ended up teaching these classes called Reclaim Your Happiness that had to do with that like meditation album that I made a spirit voyage. And what I was doing was kind of using Kundalini Yoga as a way to move the body. And then I would go into sort of Abraham teachings, which is what I was kind of getting into like Got how it. I joined the yeah. other cult. I understand. Yeah. Okay, so now go ahead and jump in. Now I understand where you're going. Yeah. So I, I think because of the information that I was getting f during the free birth, I, I started getting introduced to like Seth and like all of the, the channel stuff. You don't know who this is. So give us a perspective. Okay. So Seth oh. was. Don't go into the full yeah, story, but no, give us a yeah, I just want to give you like a, okay. So, so it's it, law of attraction. It's like law of attraction. You are the, you know. Um, okay. So for listeners to understand, essentially she's talking about like where um, someone's being channeled. So like there's mm -hmm. Abraham, right? The Abraham, and then I don't know who Seth is, but you know, where information comes through to- He was like, uh, when, he was like from the eighties or they were, it's like earlier. Yeah. Um, so Abraham might be too, but- Right, Abraham Hicks, isn't that yeah. what it's called? Okay, go ahead. Yeah, so I started getting into that and that was like its own problem, <laughs> but it, it got me thinking differently which I needed um, because up until now, it was like, what is wrong with me that this isn't working for me? What is wrong with me? And what I was getting from the Abraham teachings was like, everything is actually, I, don't, I, I'm, I confuse kind of the Joshua teachings and the Abraham teachings because I ended up going towards this other channel, Joshua. So I, I'm confused. But anyway, the, the main message was like, you, there is no good and bad you know, that everything is qualitative or personal and you make everything what it is, right? And, and I know Yogi Bhajan sort of says that, but it, it, it's different. <laughs> okay, so what I'm hearing you say is that by starting to put your attention on the Abraham, did it start with Abraham Hicks teachings or are you saying it started with Seth teachings? Well, no, it was mostly Abraham Hicks, yeah. So it's by, by putting attention on law of attraction and starting going more into that, you started changing your own thinking patterns a little bit because you picked up on differences, right? And started getting more into that and then infusing it into your lifestyle and kind of like making different choices with how you were interpreting your life, but through this lens of the law of attraction more. Yeah, well, and what got me there was this next question that I started to ask myself because now I knew how to be part of something and I knew how to make music that felt good but I didn't know how to be, to make a lucrative income doing what I was doing. I didn't know how to be financially solvent because mm -hmm. everything was sort of, it was always tight, you know, in, in, in my marriage. So it's like, how do I make money? How do I feel good making music, be part of it, but how do I make money? That, that was sort of how it came to me. And so, you know, law of attraction came to me. Um, so, and what, what came of that, which seems sort of silly was this deep desire to eat fish. Like I wanted it more than even when I was pregnant with, with Umbridenture, which was meat, not fish, but like, I wanted it. And I felt this like really, it was, it was like a, it was almost anxiety producing. I was like, I wanted it, but I can't have it. I want it, but I can't have it. 
you know, because I've taken Umrit, I've agreed, I'm not, you know, for the rest of my life, I'm not, I'm not doing this. Um, and, and I realized I was like, okay, my mental health is actually, um, is actually, uh, you know, in danger here. Maybe it's less dangerous than just eating fish. <laughs> <laughs> so, so I remember I went to Whole Foods and I got some oysters because like ethically, this seemed like the, the least, um, troublesome thing. Cause they don't have a nervous system. <laughs> and, and I remember just like, so, I mean, the taste of these oysters was like the best thing on the planet when, when I had them, um, wow. I felt so freeing. It was, it was amazing. It was like I had chosen to put myself in a prison cell. I had the key in my pocket and I finally decided to just like turn it, you know? Um, that's what it felt like, it was amazing. Um, that's something that they talk about too. It's like, you can't like, there's no way that oysters would feel that amazing if you hadn't been that restricted before, right? So it's like we, we go through these, you know, these this dance of oppositions because we like to feel extremes, you know, we, as as humans. And I'm not saying that we that we like all, you know, that we like all of it equally or that we would, you know, um, run towards. And I don't know what to say. But anyway, so um, that sort of took me to like it was like these sort of like little baby steps right like okay i'm eating fish now and i'm eating fish in secret because nobody can know about this in, in our community mm. and i i i can't remember what ha oh i joined this spiritual boot camp boot camp i become a coach um I, you know, I start coaching people and I'm teaching kind of Kundalini yoga with my emotions stuff and secretly eating fish. Anyway, my friend, my friend takes me to this breath work um, thing and I have this experience, which I'd never had before because I had, I really didn't have a connection with, with he who calls himself Yogi Bhajan. Um, I, I just didn't, I had a community, I had a, you know, a relationship with the community. I really didn't like hearing him speak because I, he made me feel kind of stupid. Like, I'm like, it seems like everybody gets this, but I don't, you know, like, like it, it was, it was, uh, mm. yeah. Anyway. So I go to this breathwork session and I feel this just infusion of love. Like I'm just so oxygenated and like love, 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 love. And I, I can't describe it any other way than I hear his voice, but it's not, it's not like auditory. It's more like a, a feeling. And I'll, I'm going to talk about that afterwards because I really don't believe like it was him, but he says to me, cause I'm, I'm very conflicted. Right. I mean, I'm, I've like taken vows, but I'm breaking them. And I'm, I'm like, you know, like feeling confined. I don't want to do this anymore. Like, I, I don't like this commitment I've made. And he says to me, he says, this was not meant to be everything for you. This was a stepping stone. And you were meant to, to keep going. This, you know, this is not the end. You don't have to stay here. And what, um, oh shoot, what else? I'm getting excited and I'm forgetting. Your time. Oh, you would not have listened to me if I had told you you were perfect. So it was this idea of like, if I hadn't told you that you needed to improve in some way, you wouldn't have listened. And that's true. I was at a place where I wanted to be told, this is what you do to be a worthy human being mm. at the time that I joined. Mm. And it, it freed me. It was very freeing. I mean, I realized now that it wasn't, I needed to hear it from him because at that point he was like a figure that had some authority and some weight. I almost felt like I was um, disrespecting him in my choices. So I needed to know that like we were okay. But now that I understand kind of like who he really was and all that, I just feel like it was, it was me. I was telling myself it's okay. You know? Mm. Yeah. And these voices can get internalized in where we are placing our authority. So we can, it, these sound current can sound like 
where we're placing our authority, but it's always our own inner soul pulse. Yeah. It's just morphing into the sound current that we need to hear to, to, to listen. Right. And, and I, I get what you're saying in terms of like, as we let ourselves get cracked open, you can see the same thing from a different lens and now it has a different meaning, but still the same rich meaning, just more of yourself in it. Yeah. But you know, it happens in stages because I was ready to hear that, but I wasn't ready to live that. Mm. So it took, it took me some time to kind of really, really internalize that and process that. And, you know, at the point where, do you want me to like cut this short? I feel, feel, feel badly is you're, you're not enjoy, a rush, yeah, right? no, enjoying the okay, time. Okay, good. No, yeah. I love talking. I, <laughs> I don't mind. Well, as long as you're staying on topic, I think it's great. Okay. I think you're also bringing up really probably more important areas of resonance than you know. And I think it's just really great. I think the pace you're on is just fine. Okay. Thank you. All right. I, I have a, I have a, a worthiness issue too, of like taking up some too much time. So thank you for walking me through that. Um, so yeah, I'm, I've, I've had that experience. I'm like, I'm running, I'm coaching. And this was another thing that I realized throughout since I joined 3HO or since I signed up for that teacher training is I was taught in that intensive that I now knew everything. And I applied that to almost every area of my life. Like if something was working for me, even if it wasn't actually working for me, but it was supposed to, I felt like I was expert enough to tell someone that they should also do that. Mm. So I glided into this coaching role in sort of in the, the sort of same stance of like, I have now mastered the idea of emotions and I understand how to quell them and neutralize. Cause I wasn't really, I wasn't really as evolved in my understanding of emotions. Yeah. We weren't feeling them yet. We were, just, <laughs> right. we were, we were, we were mastered <laughs> thinking about our feeling, right? <laughs> right. Yes, exactly. <laughs> that one really is. Yeah. <laughs> we like to hover and thinking about oh, here's a few bottles you can <laughs> shove them in but yeah so I I got really comfortable with this role of like advising people and because of like you you know you said it because of the fact that I was gaining a little bit of notoriety with my music people didn't have a problem seeing me that way mm. so it was you know it was twofold it was like and Black. I Flag. This is the symptom of, of looking for authority outside of ourselves. This is literally the, it's both ways always because we're yeah. seeking it and somebody's seeking our energy of that. So anyway, yeah. Like, totally. Yeah. And you can see how people, it could be very easy to take advantage of that. Easy. I mean, I totally could have, I didn't, <laughs> but, but I totally could have, you know? Ah, <sighs> what do you mean? Anyway. Um, so this is where, like, I, I feel like the first part of the talk was like, okay, this is like acceleration, acceleration, acceleration. This is where things started to sort of like totally accelerate again for me. I signed up for, um, another boot camp with this guy that I met through the coaching boot camp that I had taken. So I'm, so if you can picture it, I'm like, I've taken a boot camp. I'm now teaching a boot camp, and I'm also listening to this guy's podcast who was in the boot camp that I just took, thinking I would really like to know what he's doing because he's teaching his own boot camp because it seems like it's really working and mine is eh, mine's doing okay but not like as amazingly as his. So I and he's a channel. He channels a, a group of beings called Joshua, and I have like a an intro session with him, I guess, or like a discovery call, like you would call it, right? So he's, he's trying to get me into the boot camp. He does it a little bit differently than most people because he's like very free, and, you know, kind of whatever happens, happens. But in it, he tells me, you can take my material and, you know, just, just use it. Like take whatever you want. And, you know, it's not copyright. It's whatever I'm going, okay, great. Um, but he, he signs me up for his boot camp, So I take it. And, but in the call, he's asking me about the vows that I took specifically. So he's like, so if you wanted to take like psychedelics, you couldn't do that. And I'm like, well, 
no, I could, but I've agreed not to, you know, it's not like I, I have a physical, you know, I have the hand to grab it and the mouth to put it in, but I've decided not to, like, this is a commitment that I've made. And he's like, well, you know, I can see how commitments would be a good, would be good in the way of discipline, but basically I'm paraphrasing, like, you know, you can't commit to the same thing for your whole life because that will stifle your growth, right? Like you, you can't know at 30 what you're going to need when you're 40 and 50 and, and whatever. And I don't know what I, I'm, I'm just relating what he said. So it got me thinking, okay, I had, we had decided that year for the first time not to go to summer solstice. And what year is this? This is 2019. And this, every year before then, you had gone to summer. Every school single school. fucking year. And at and the end of vacations that. every solstice, I, I'm going, not again. I'm not doing this next year. And then we would do it again. <laughs> but anyway, sure. so yeah. So mind you, so I went like pregnant with newborn, with toddler, pregnant with, <laughs> with toddler, then with newborn and then, and then that was it. Then, then with toddler and newborn, then that was it. Um, so yeah, uh, we decide to go to Europe instead. So we go to the German yoga festival. So I've had this conversation. We're still in Phoenix. We're like kind of mentally preparing to go on this tour through Europe. Like I, I'm going to be, I'm going to be doing some performances. I'm going to see my dad who, who lives in France part-time still. And, um, and I'm thinking about this conversation that I've had with this channel about, you know, about freedom and these commitments that I've made that honestly, I'm not upholding anyway, you know, I'm, I'm eating fish. Um, I, well, that's the only one, but, but yeah, I mean, you know, I, I was being lenient with myself. So it was sort of like, you know, how much more freedom do I want? But and you're still in the community, you're still living there. You, this is just the first time you're making a change. You go to solstice, you go to yeah. Europe instead of go to solstice. Mm -hmm. So I go back to the house and I, I have a conversation with Huddy Mender that I'm, I'm really nervous about because I'm going to propose to him the idea that like when we go to Europe, I want to experience Europe like a European, like I'm going to want to have a glass of wine. I'm going to want to, you know, whatever. And, and it was funny because I think he had been kind of watching me go through these he's really into the channeling now, but at the time he was sort of watching like, like what's kind of, what's going on with her, you know? Um, so he had been shifting a little bit too at the, at the same time. And so when I brought this up to him, he wasn't like super surprised. And he said, well, yeah, we're going to be in Germany. I'll want to have a beer. I was like, okay. <laughs> of course. <laughs> <laughs> What? Of course he said that. <laughs> Who would want to have a book in Germany? <laughs> well, it's so funny because, you know, now that I'm like open about this, like I find out that, you know, everybody's having these thoughts, you know, everybody was bending the rules, but I didn't know that, you know? <laughs> so, so, um, secrecy. oh, the secrecy. What's that? Oh, I know. Yeah. Well, that's what happens when there's shame associated with, you know, the choices that you make. If, if you're yeah. bad for doing something, then you're going to hide it. Right. You know? So, so yeah. So he says, and this, <laughs> so this was like, this was like, you know, it's like my life flipped on its head at this point. It was like, he goes, you know, but if all the Umrit vows that we made, <laughs> if I were going to break one, it would be the mon monogamy one. <laughs> that's what he, that's what he says. Wow. Yeah. So he was like, what would you think about having an open relationship? And I'm like, and like I'm like, I came here to talk to you about wine. <laughs> wow. <laughs> like, give, give me a moment. Give me a moment. But honestly, I had such an open mind at this point. Like I, you know, it was like, don't send your kids to school, birth without a doctor or a midwife or, you know, like it was sort of like, I'll consider it. You know, I didn't say yes. But by the time we got back from Europe, I'm like, I haven't worn a head covering in months. 
except for when I performed. Um, I loved how the Spaniards related to the Kundalini yoga because it was just, was like they did that, but they also had their own culture, you know, yeah. they, and, and they didn't feel weird or, or conflicted in incorporating it any way they chose, you know, it was like, we can do Kundalini yoga and then we can smoke a cigarette, you know, yeah. we can go. <laughs> um, and, and vivacious and lively themselves. Totally. You know, love that too. Yeah. So, so I, I came back feeling very good and I was, I was invited um, by, I ended up singing with Sonata when I was in London for like a, a tiny song on her tour, which was so fun. But what was really fun about it was getting to meet the audience. And I got to meet this woman, this Punjabi woman, um, Padan Kaur, she was, you know, she's my age, um, who, who's also a singer in, in London. And so she invited me to come sing in October for a Gurdwara event. And I was like, yeah, sure. I get to go to London. That sounds awesome. And then I'm also going like, I've never played for Gurdwara because that was never really something that I felt comfortable with. You know, I love doing concerts, but I didn't feel great in that. It felt confining. It felt like I had to be a certain kind of, of person to do it in Gurdwara. Mm -hmm. I'm not sure that that's true, but that's my perception about it. So, so I was a little bit conflicted about that. But then I was also invited to do a concert at the end of October in Vermont. Was it Vermont? No, it was Millis. Millis. Um, they had a festival. So between then and, and Millis, there was going to be like a two week period or a week and a half period. And I was already on the East Coast. I was, you know, for Millis. So I asked Teddy Mender, I was like, could, do you think it'd be okay if when we come back from Europe in October, if you just had the kids for that whole, you know, whole period of time, I'll go to England, I'll stay with my parents on the East Coast, then I'll go to Massachusetts. And, you know, and then I'll come back. And he was like, sure. And this was new because as I said, like he was, you know, slow to, slow to, to caring for, for, you know, for our kids, like feeling comfortable with that. So that was great. Um, but that got canceled. What happened was, <clears throat> well, they lost their funding, but an opening came up in this Joshua event. Um, uh, the, they were having like a retreat that exact same weekend. I was like, sure, I'll take that. So uh, I'll do the Josh event. I'll be gone for two weeks and then I'll um, go to this Millis thing. And he, he was going to go to this conference at the, when I got back, like right when I got back, actually there was going to be some overlap where he wasn't there. So his sister was going to take care of our kids. So before all of this happens, I'm like, you know what? Let's try the open marriage thing. I'm going to mute myself. I have to clear my throat. So I have no idea what this means. I don't know what open marriage means. I had to watch YouTube videos to like figure out what this means, right? Yeah. But I mean, what I sort of get about it is that we get to see other people, I guess. Um, so I go, to, <clears throat> I go to, to North Carolina at this retreat knowing that something is going to happen. I don't, you know, you just know. And I end up meeting my partner whom I'm, I'm living with now. But what ends up happening is, so I was talking about these questions, right? These questions that I asked myself. And one of the questions that I think developed during my marriage was like, what does it feel like to be cherished? What does it feel like to actually be desired, you know, to be loved? Because I didn't feel that in my marriage. Like we had a very nice friendship, as I said, but we weren't, yeah. So that was missing. Um, and I, it was like the answer to this question. Like he was, he was like the answer to this question. And it was weird. He said things that like, I wanted someone to say to me with, you know, without knowing that, that like, I, I felt like I had sort of built him. There's issues with every relationship. <laughs> it's not, nothing is perfect. And he was but, a part of this second cult that you found yourself in. Yes, exactly. He obviously steeped in it himself. I miss that. Yeah. He not, he, he was, you know, he was sort of like the, the, the kid who goes to Kundalini yoga class once a week. Okay. kind of involved, you know, it wasn't like, yeah, but, but, but yeah, I ended up being part of that group for about a year and it, it really did help me to leave. And in, 
in in discovering like in reading the the Premka group and reading not the group the book and then reading a stories in the Premka group and discovering all these I mean I didn't like just horrendous you know narratives um childhoods uh, adulthoods I mean just discovering all this information I just delve deeply into cults like I watched all the Scientology documentaries I watched the the next scene like I just became obsessed because there were it helped me so much to learn the the common threads of yes. of cults and when I started to recognize these threads in that group in this in this new group I realized that I I'm a little bit of an addict you know when it comes to being part of a community where I know what the rules are you know, and, and the rules were pretty loose with this one, but, but yeah, so I saw the potential for abuse there as well. I didn't see any, but I saw the potential for it. And so I, I decided that I was going to stop mm. um, doing that as well. So because all of this, you started getting all into that during 2019 and then right into Premka book, right? Because then you started reading then that opened your eyes and you started just getting into calls. So you had already been doing your levels of questioning by the time that happened, it allowed you to just yeah. dive into, I found reading about the cults too, um, so helpful at that time and the formula, even the academic explanations of cults where they studied yeah. children born in and the impact psychologically and, and emotional developmentally, as well as the people who join by volition and the effect of, of critical thinking and other levels of our development. So yeah. beautiful, sh beautiful share there in, in that doing that level of education, like sharpens our own sword to be able to be a, on a better radar so that we can notice the radars of like what you're saying is early signs, warnings that do exist. And y you don't know where it will morph, but you can, have the radar ahead of time without getting all the way in, so to speak, and giving ourselves up to it. Yeah. One of the things I found most interesting that um, I think it was Steve Hassan that talks about, or like, oh, no, no, actually, this was part of a um, Matthew Remsky seminar that I ended up taking. Mm. He talks about how the, the, um, the, like the mission that they purport to have, I wrote this down, and the actions taken to accomplish that mission are completely misaligned. Oof, say it again. Isn't that interesting? The purported mission and the actions taken to accomplish said mission are misaligned. That's my paraphrasing. But yeah, beautifully said. But Matt, Matthew Rensky is um, he has the Conspirituality podcast and uh, they are doing there's several of them that do that. But again it's a worthy listen especially of how um, spiritual communities can morph into all sorts of cult formations that are magnificently uh, disguised, but then not so magnificently disguised. If you see, if you learn these things, then you can yeah. start learning to ask better questions. For sure. So I think that sort of takes me to <laughs> the end well, of my long journey here. Thank you. My, what I, <laughs> I want to, what I wonder a little bit is like, it, it kind of felt like it was like just this dive into this mystical tradition that really took you up into the magic of it and you changed and liked all these things but also didn't like all these things and you're you know you're still a musician that has a change so much of you 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 for lack of a better word became an expert birther because you decided to trust yourself more than the rules of order externally so you're, you're pointing out things and i'm wondering how that um feels to like transition from being a kundalini yoga songstress to everyday life in the world porter singer and and how that because that, that there's a there's something about the mystique and the community and the longing and it's very hard to leave that level of stuff and so having something else to go to i hear help you do that but it also you're still a musician and impacted the kundalini yoga 3hl community significantly with your music which by the way i never even got to that actually the right the we need to go back to that i'm gonna get a glass of water 
I'm going to take you with me because my. All right. So that's a great question. <laughs> One of the things that I heard from the Scientology stuff um, from Leah Remini was, and I really felt was this loss of purpose. Because what, what this gave to so many of us, I'll speak for myself, this gave to me was a sense of purpose. It gave, my, it gave me a really grand sense of purpose. It was like, I was not only making music, I was making music to save humanity. And that is really different from I am making music for, I don't know, awards or um, acclaim or, you know, whatever, which I could never really motivate myself very much for, to be honest. So this, it gave me like a really good motivation um because my other motivation is just you know getting my truth out that's that's my main motivation and or has been so what it what it's like now i've gone back to songwriting i really i really love songwriting i really love lyrics and and i missed i missed writing lyrics i miss telling stories you know from from those days when you did all your recordings, none of that was your written music. You had other people, you were singing other people's music. I was always writing the music. Um, sometimes I did some co-writes, but you know, the mantras are not my own lyrics yeah. is what I mean. And mm -hmm. I did a couple of songs here and there in some albums, but, but I mostly used Yogi Bhajan words and, um, and, uh, mantras. So yeah, I wasn't doing so much lyric writing. Um, just to actually to talk about that, that, you know, I am the light of my soul that we used, that they used for the facets of the master. Thinking back, that was like my first clue that something was not right. <clears throat> okay, so pause. I want to just point out that as listeners, um, Siddha Goon had, you know, her two albums that she described in her story were both very, very popular in the Kundalini yoga world. I remember being a teacher and a student and, and hearing this and the I am, I am, I mean, it was like certain ones, there was a couple of your songs that were just so bliss and so widely distributed throughout classes and things like this. And so speak to the song for those that don't know it, speak it out loud. So yeah, that, so the song the is called mind. Bliss and it uses the, the mantra, I am the light of my soul. I am uh, beautiful, I am bountiful, I am bliss, I am, I am. And I wrote, that was one of the first things that I ever wrote, not the lyrics, but the, the melody for it. And we ended up putting it on the music within. And it took off. I mean, it's, it's crazy. So Darshan can't believe that he still gets money from this. I mean, because he, he doesn't make albums anymore, but he's, he's still getting money from this. Um, I didn't make any money from giving it to Facets of the Master because that was a donation. Which is How did that come about? How did that come about? So they, somebody approached uh, you to ask? Uh, Simran, is that Simran who does White Tantric Yoga? Okay. He just asked if she could use it and we were honored. So we said, yes. Um, and no contracts, no discussions of that or, or, um, or I don't remember a contract there may have been, but it would have been something to the effect of you will give this to us for free. <laughs> so, so yeah, it was, you know, it was played literally all over the world. I mean, I had people that would email me and say like, they played just that song. Cause sometimes people would, would play like the slideshow and they put like another, they'd mute it and they put another CD on or, you know, a, a CD, I'm, <laughs> you know, a, a Playlist. MP3 player. Um, and yeah, exactly. They'd use something else, but in some places they would literally play that song on repeat during every single break. Um, so, so people, that song was heard a lot. Pause. Um, I want to say that when I was going to the, um, yoga festival, European yoga festival, that would be, um, 2015, 16, uh, sorry, 16, 17, 18. Um, absolutely. Every, every at white tantric at the break of every break the slideshow is playing. And so I remember distinctly being aware of that because A, it was nostalgia energy. Like I look, you're looking at those pictures and you're like, mm -hmm. oh, you know, and it's hitting these like deep levels of nostalgia in me, but also the, the co collective psyche and then your music on top of that. And you could just see the, the painting 
kind of the future painting of, you know, what was propagated of the master, the master in all the facets of his amazing being. Right. And I remember looking at that and was like, what a piece of marketing. And I found inside, I remember, I, I find it so sad that they're painting him to be a saint, mm. you know, because there's so many dark aspects that are going to come to light. And anyway, your music is definitely played all around the world in that capacity. Yeah. So two things about that. One, it was in watching those pictures because we were given a slideshow to see when we decided to give that music just so they could say, this is what we want to use your music for. It was in watching that slideshow that I got my first sort of like, something's not right here. He's like shirtless in these photos with these women all over him. Like, but it, but I didn't register it enough, but I noticed. Um, so when I was reading Premka, <laughs> um, I re I remembered that. Um, and then the, the other thing was that that was a huge, huge source of guilt for me when I found out about all this stuff, because I felt complicit. I felt like I had been used as a tool to recruit, to put a sunny face on this to you know and I felt really awful I felt really really awful for that I had co-written a song I mean <laughs> literally I co-wrote a song with a rapist yeah um so that that was a few days <laughs> that was a few days of of crying um about that but but that song also plays for people in spaces completely unrelated to Kundalini yoga and I know has helped a lot of people. So it's, again, it's like, what, <laughs> what do you do? <laughs> so anyway, it exists. It exists. It has a life of its own. Yeah. And, you know, I firmly stand on the knowing inside myself because it's work, it's work for me that as we untangle it within ourselves, we're able to hold the polarity more cleanly without denying one, hiding one, pushing one aside yeah. and making the other one allow, but we can hold that like, wow, you know, like predator is in us as much as it's everywhere, but we have to be able to get to the point where we can speak to the real predator energy that lives all around us is in us, is in others, and that we allow to take place regularly, you know, consciously or unconsciously. And yet, you know, it's our community wouldn't have morphed into this if we're not all on some level not paying attention seriously. Yeah, yeah. So beautiful, oof, so beautiful. So yeah. I'm, I'm writing, it's funny because when you asked me to, to provide a song for you, which comes next, um, what, what came to me was like, oh, I should share something that I've been writing. I don't have anything ready though, so I didn't do that. So I, I picked something relatively similar to what I would have said. <laughs> well, yeah, before we go into your song, I just want to kind of land all of this and just ask, is there, you know, as you reflect and you think about everything that you've shared, is there, is there anything more you want to share with us, you know, we're talking about a, a, a pretty large part of your life and then a fast morph out and yeah. I think I have, I think I have shared, oh, one of the things um, is that I'm so glad that you're doing this podcast. One, because it's just, it's fabulous, but two, because I actually ended up sharing on the Premka group when I was like outraged and energized about about all this that like we really have to put information out there for people and people got really upset with me when I suggested like podcasts and stuff a few people because they're like well for fuck's sake we've been doing this for years no one's been listening to us which is totally legitimate um but I I think the fact that it is new and that it's on new types of media because what existed before were sort of written accounts on on websites um, I think that this is really positive. I don't think that it makes everything that went before it invalid or, or pointless. I think that it just highlights it and, and validates it really. 
Um, so yeah, I'm really, I'm really glad that, that you've created a, an actual platform for, for these stories to be shared. Well, I think you bring up a good point. And I, I want to say that the group that, um, that Porter is referring to is the Facebook, the private Facebook group that got created pretty fast right after um, the book Premka was released. And this group really served, um, it was at the point, at that time it was called Premka Group, but now it's morphed into Beyond the Cage, the aftermath of YB. And so that group itself has evolved. And at first it started as kind of like this inner support system where stories started getting told, but they were told within this safe environment. And then that quickly morphed to not being safe for some people and safe mm -hmm. for only other people. And as it's evolved, again, it still exists. And I think it's a wonderful portal for information and to really get caught up to speed on what's been happening. But I can't agree more. It was a part of my desire. That group was existing and I was so grateful. And then private Zooms calls were happening where people were sharing. And then this private second gen group got created and I could feel this inner fire in me that was losing my mind and I was like why are all these stories still being told in private in private I know yeah <laughs> it only reflected the resounding silence of our ch my childhood of our community of the gaslighting that just continues to be spewed in the name of spiritual enlightenment and I just I found myself like revolted, like disgusted. And I was like, this has got to be available for just people to hear, not to push, not to push an agenda, but just share your, your real life story because you matter. And in a community where we didn't know we've been silenced, we don't even know what it feels like to let ourselves be seen and witnessed. And it itself can break us open to see more. We don't have to go to another cult to see more, but I loved that you were vulnerable enough to share us your story in that way, because sometimes we do. Sometimes we do end up in another cult before we see the pattern of behavior, but we can also start trying new things and breaking out of our comfort zones and realizing there are other platforms that we can share these necessary stories yeah yeah and the the really sad part about the privacy thing is that I, and I understand that this they're vulnerable shares and not everybody wants to go public with their stories but if you are willing like the people who the people who are still out there doing the exact same things that they always have they do not deserve your silence they do not deserve privacy because you're protecting them at the cost of other people that they could become predators towards. Um, so, yeah. It's exactly right. And it's actually a predator's tool. One of the ways that predators are able to stay hidden and go from community to community or new ashram to new ashram is that we take that code of silence because we don't want to disrupt somebody else's life or take yeah. the, have to face the shame of that as a ripple effect of our telling our story. Right. But I can't, again, I can't encourage enough what you're saying. Your story matters and it's yours. And there are people still out there teaching and healing and there are students still searching for the places to belong. And they have every right to make their choices. But if we have all lenses of people's experience, they can listen to the podcast and be able to make better informed choices. Absolutely. Again, I wanna thank you for your vulnerability and giving us exposure into you. You know, these things aren't always easy shares. They're very personal from, you know, childhood to your marriage to birthing to all the things. And also that you spoke to the, the real beautiful qualities of, of music uh, the tradition of musicians in our community, as well as um, the richness that community offers in, 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 in so many reasons why we long for it, right? In, in the support system built in, like these things are very real and should not be discounted. And yet we have to see the full picture. We can't pretend it is more than it is. So tell us about your song. Okay, so I picked a song from a musical called Waitress that was written by Sarah Bareilles. 
And this spoke to me because Cerebralis was becoming popular or had just sort of broken out when I was being a singer songwriter. And her first album, Little Voice, was like sort of felt auto autobiographical when she did it. So I have had a connection with her for a while. But this song is is about someone who's been in service um, at the expense of her own identity. Um, in her case, a waitress. But I realized like, you know, we too were in the service industry and we too gave up a lot. Um, and there's this line in it about, um, you know, if I could, if I could give it all up, I would, you know, go rewrite an ending or two. And my takeaway from this whole experience was that I, I do wonder what my life would be like if I had not tried to run away from who I was and join a cult, but I don't regret it because that would mean not having my two children. So I could, I could never say that I wish this hadn't happened. Mm, thank you. And here we go, Sarah Morales. And the song is, She Used to Be Mine. These shoes and this apron, that place. And again, we don't play the full clip because this is uh, copyrighted material. And yet you can listen to the Uncomfortable Conversations playlist um, on Spotify to be able to hear the full beautiful song of every episode. So thank you for that beautiful share. Oh, cool. That's a great <laughs> idea. I'll share that. Yeah, absolutely. So again, I want to just thank everyone. This has been another episode of the Uncomfortable Conversations podcast the untold stories of the 3HO Kundalini Yoga community. If you'd like to contribute to this podcast, you can make a one-time or monthly donation at gurunishan.com forward slash uncomfortable conversations. And if you'd like to be a guest on the podcast, please send me an email at gn at gurunishan.com or just go to the website and you can contact me from there. Thanks so much again, Porter Singer for being a guest today. Thank you. And we'll talk to you on the next episode.